Thank you all for being here. Oh, now we're on. Perfect. So I just said hello. Thank you for being here. Just in case you couldn't hear me before, uh, it's, it's a thrill to come in and see such a, a, a great crowd and what a perfect person to draw that great crowd. But Elizabeth Colbert, uh, really, I've been a, a fan of Elizabeth's for uh, many a year, and it's just, just thrilling to have you here, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank I'm you. really looking forward to talking to you tonight. Uh, Elizabeth's most recent book is Under a White Sky. And um, if you would consent, it would be great to, uh, to start our conversation with a little bit about the book, perhaps, and, and uh, a passage from it. Sure. So, so the book is um, <coughs> about, really, um, man and nature, humans and nature, and how various ways in which we've intervened uh, in the natural world have now led to us, led to efforts to re-intervene, to counteract the previous interventions. And Eric and I were talking earlier, and I decided to read a little passage from a um, chapter that is about uh, a whole sort of fake habitat that has been built for uh, a creature called the devil's whole pupfish. And I, in the interest of time, sometimes hard to dive into a book, in the interest of time, I will summarize and say that we, uh, the chapter begins, we're uh, walking through the, um, through Death Valley with one of the 49ers um, who has arrived there, uh, a guy named William Lewis Manley, who left us a very detailed uh, account of his misadventures, which included going off the trail and uh, getting you know, completely lost uh, in Death Valley. So we'll pick them up there when they're lost in Death Valley. Uh, Manley was traveling with a friend who had a wife and three small children. He served as a sort of scout, hiking ahead of the wagons to reconnoiter. The reports he delivered back to camp were so disheartening that after a while, his friend asked him please to shut up. His wife couldn't take it anymore. As the party approached Death Valley, at that point an uncharted expanse of desert, the mood grew particularly grim. Sitting around the campfire a few nights after Manley had broken down in tears, one man described the region as, quote, the creator's dumping place, where he left the worthless dregs after making a world. Another said it must be the very place where Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt, <laughs> only the pillar had been broken up and spread around the country. <laughs> Just at the edge of Death Valley, spirits briefly lifted. On a stony ledge, the party chanced upon a cavern that contained a pool of warm, clear water. A few of the men plunged in, one recorded in his diary that he'd enjoyed an extremely refreshing bath. Manley peered into the water and noticed something strange. The pool was surrounded by rock and sand. It was miles from any other water body, yet it was dancing with fish. Decades later, he would remember these tiny minnows, each not much more than an inch long. The cavern the 49ers chanced upon is now known as Devil's Hole, and the minnows as Devil's Hole pupfish, or scientifically speaking, Sopranodon diabolus. Devil's Hole pupfish are, as Manley described them, about an inch long. They are sapphire blue with intense black eyes and heads that are large for their body size. They're most easily distinguish distinguished by an absence. They're missing the pelvic fins that other pupfish possess. How Devil's Hole got its pupfish is, as one ecologist has put it, a beautiful enigma. The cavern is a geological oddity, a portal to a vast maze-like aquifer that runs far beneath the ground and holds water left over from the Pleistocene. It seems unlikely that the fish's ancestors could have traveled through the aquifer. The best guess of ichthyologists is that they were washed into Devil's Hole at a time when the whole area was wetter. The pool, which is about 60 feet long and, 80 feet, and 8 feet wide, constitutes Sopranodon diabolus's entire habitat. This, it's believed, <clears throat> is the smallest range of any vertebrate. I first learned about Devil's Hole thanks to a crime that took place there. On a warm evening in the spring of 2016, three men, all apparently drunk, wait, scaled the chain link fence that surrounds the cavern. 
one shot out, a security camera, doffed his clothes, went for a dip, and left his underwear floating in the pool. Another vomited. The following day, a single pupfish was found dead, and a necropsy was performed on it. This led to felony charges. The police eventually released surveillance footage, which I watched and watched again. There were jerky shots of the men driving up to the fence in an ATV. Then, from an underwater camera, there were fuzzy shots of two feet walking along a ledge of rock, kicking up bubbles. Everything about the crime, the piscine necropsy, the county jail's worth of security, the little fish marooned in the middle of the Mojave, intrigued me. I started reading around and happened upon Manley's memoir, Death Valley, in 49. I learned that desert fish are a rich and diverse group. Every year, the Desert Fishes Council holds a meeting somewhere in northern Mexico or the western US. Typically, the program for the meeting runs to 40 pages. Pubfish are so named because males wrangling over territory look a bit like puppies tussling. In the Death Valley area alone, there were at one time 11 species and subspecies of pupfish. One is now extinct, another is believed to be extinct, and the rest are all threatened. The Devil's Hole pupfish may well be the rarest fish in the world. In an effort to preserve it, a kind of fishy west world has been created. <laughs> an exact replica of the actual pool down to the ledge where the skinny dipper's feet were caught on tape. Meanwhile, a plume of radioactive water is creeping its way toward the cavern from the Nevada test site. The more I read, the more I thought, I really ought to, to visit Devil's Hole. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, that's wonderful. <laughs> So the sixth extinction deals with um, our biodiversity crisis. Under a white sky is looking at humanity's, um, the, the problems that we've created and their attempts to do something about it. And I'm, I'm curious what draws you or has drawn you to the larger themes of your book and with that, and you in fact mentioned in The Sixth Extinction, there's, there are so many stories that you could choose from. What drew you to the specific stories and how did you make your choice? Well, what drew me to the subject, you know, a subject or subjects sort of, I guess, um, originally, and I been, was talking to some folks earlier here, you know, I was, I was actually originally a, a political reporter, and the most time I ever spent in Kansas was um, doing a profile of Bob Dole. I spent a lot of time in mm. Russell, Kansas, believe it or not. Um, and eventually I um, went to the New Yorker. I, was at the New York Times, I went to the New Yorker, and I was also covering politics. Um, but this was sort of at the moment when the news cycle was really speeding up, and it was getting very difficult to cover politics for, for a weekly. And I started thinking about um, issues that, the really big issues, the issues that were gonna be, uh, you know, still the same truths were gonna hold a week in a week, or two weeks, or a month, or a year, or two or really, to be honest, um, now we're getting to the point where it's gonna hold for you know, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. And, and that drew me to the issue of climate change, which at that time was still you know, considered sort of a matter of debate. And I got this crazy idea that I was gonna settle this debate <laughs> uh, by writing about it. And that's sort of how I got on this you know, beat, we'll call it a beat. And when I went to write The Sixth Extinction, um, that was actually sort of prompted um, by something that had happened right near where I live. I live in Western Massachusetts, and about an hour away, the very first cases of white nose syndrome. Have people heard of white nose syndrome? It's a very disease of, of afflicting bats. It's, I'm sure it's here in Kansas by now. Um, struck, and it was, a, it was a pretty big news story. It was this fungal pathogen that just has killed millions and millions of bats. And that um, is the story that sort of got me interested in, in what became the sixth extinction. And you know, as I write in that book, um, you, know, you could go out in your backyard and if you had someone from, you know, uh, someone who knew what they were looking for, they could tell you, well, what used to be here and what's not here anymore. Um, 
And the way I ended up choosing the actual stories that I told, you know, part of it, to be perfectly frank, was happenstance. You know, I, I, I came across someone who was going to somewhere interesting and was willing to take me along. That was part right. of it. Um, and part of it was I was looking for stories that were exemplary in some way. They were exemplary of um, a problem that we have, be it you know habitat destruction or uh, ocean acidification or climate change. So I was looking for exemplary stories. But really, um, certainly nowadays, that point it was maybe a teeny bit harder. But certainly nowadays, I, I, you could go anywhere. Wow, that's. So one of the things that I'm fascinated about when I'm reading your work is the intersection between science and storytelling. And I know that you have a, a job to do around taking that science, and, the, and many, much of it is complex and detailed and arcane, and you need to interpret it for the public. And I'm, I'm just wondering about your process. How do you go about doing that? And how do you know, or, or when are you satisfied that you've done that? Well, I, I should say, you know, first of all, that I have no science background myself. I am a um, pretty much of a science, you know, novice. Um, I took one physics class in college, and I got to the final, which involved an ant crossing a turntable, I still remember that. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, we didn't, it didn't end well, let's put it that way. Um, not for the ants, <laughs> Not for the ants, well the ants probably still marching across the turntable, yeah. Um, so I am really approach this, you know, with the attitude that if, if I understand it, my reader, you know, my reader will understand, I come with the same, um, you know, basic level of, of science education as a, a, a lay person. Um, and, you know, the method is, honestly, it's a lot like all other reporting, which is, um, you know, you get someone to explain something to you over and over and over again until you feel like you finally understand it. And one of the, you know, real um, luxuries of, of working for the New Yorker, just dropped, sorry, uh, working for the New Yorker is to have the time to just pester people, you know, for a long time. Um, so people definitely get, you know, sick of me after a while. <laughs> um, but often I'm out with people for quite a long time, like on a week-long trip or whatever, and so I just uh, get them to explain it to me until I finally feel uh, that I've gotten it. And also I use them, honestly, as the vehicle for explaining it, you know, to other people. I, I use their voices um, right. to do that. Yeah, that's true. You You do walk us along through somebody, through the desert or the Arctic or, or whatever. So it's a real, um, uh, we, we travel the journey with you, which of course is what is so compelling about so much of your writing. And of course, here we are at the Linda Hall Library and our, our oldest book goes back to 1472. There's no way you're gonna get back to Copernicus or Kepler or whoever to, to come and interact with you like that. And I'm, I'm wondering what you feel perhaps the place of historical literature, scientific literature like ours, uh, might be in exploring the challenges of the, the future, the environment. Well, I think, you know, I think that a lot, there's a lot of great, you know, journalists are interested in stories um, and a lot of, the history of science has great stories attached to it. So even if you have, um, you know, people who went down, you know, paths that we now realize were erroneous, um, you know, there are a lot of great fights in the history of science, and those make good, those make good stories, and they also help, you know, sometimes they can really help explicate, like, how did we get, come into knowledge? The coming into knowledge is not a, it's not a clean, you know, sort of surgical process. It's often very, very messy, and I think that helps people um, relate to it. You know, people didn't just suddenly, you know, in a lot of cases, it wasn't just suddenly a light bulb going off. It was very contentious. Um, and so I, I'm 
a big reader of history of science, and I'm a big fan of using history of science to, to tell stories. Mm. So as you're telling these stories, you've now, uh, the, the, the three books that we've been talking about are not your only books, but we've, you, you, of the three, you started with Field Notes from a Catastrophe that was very firmly about climate change, then the sixth extinction, of course, we all know that, we've talked about it, then Under a White Sky. And I'm curious about your journey as an author, uh, about specifically about uh, environmental issues. And, and I'm wondering if through the progression of those books, if your thinking has changed, has evolved at all about, uh, as you've come up with the ideas, traveled the, through those stories? Well, you know, I definitely start, started out, and this is really dating, dating things, you know, <laughs> tw 20 years ago, almost exactly 20 years ago. And I think at that, at that time, if you sort of put yourself back in that time of 2004, roughly, um, you know, I think a lot of people thought, well, you know, if just if everybody knew about climate change, if people understood what was at stake, you know, mm. everything would change. Um, and, you know, that has not happened. Um, so my thinking over time has, you know, evolved in that sense. I, I don't think of this anymore as just a, an issue of, you know, people getting information, although I still think that there's a huge port, you know, proportion of the American population that for whatever reason, hasn't really, you know, um, gotten the, in, the information that they need, or has resisted, or has refused to get the information that they need. Has that? Um, but also over time, I mean, another thing that happened was I started to see, you know, I, I, the first book was very much about climate change, but in the sixth extinction, climate change is just one of many ways right. that you know humans. Their title is Welcome to the Anthropocene, and the Anthropocene is you know, this idea that we have become, humans are now the dominant geological force on the planet. Um, and that is not just by changing, you know, the climate or changing the atmosphere. There's a, actually a lot of ways people have looked very in, carefully at, like, what are the signals that are still going to be visible to a geologist, whatever, you know, species they may belong to, you know, 10 million years from now, 100 million years from now. And there are many ways that we're changing the planet, they've concluded, that will still be inscribed you know, in the rocks uh, right. 10, 20, 30, 40 million years from now. Mm. So do you think, well, let me rephrase <laughs> that. Where do you think the most important conversations are around the environment that are happening today? Well, that's a really good question. Oh, um, good. I like that. <laughs> I think that, you know, they're happening. I mean, we need pretty serious policy changes um, on a, you know, all levels. So I guess one place that they're happening, and, you know, maybe this is a complicated time to be saying this, but they're, they're happening, you know, in, in, in the halls of, of government where policy decisions are being made. They're happening, um, you know, at public utility meetings, they're happening. Um, but all of that is, they're also happening, you know, at colleges and universities and young people, um, I think, becoming, um, you know, very concerned about the planet that they're going to inherit. Um, so I think, uh, you know, and they should be happening really honestly over, you know, over dinner every night in, yeah. in homes across America, but I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that that is happening. Right. So I'd love to switch pace a little bit and think specifically about under a, under a white sky. So you are giving uh, just fantastic array of different examples of the way people are ad addressing a variety of, of concerns, environmental concerns. And perhaps you could argue this if you don't agree, but the central theme is that there's some 
serious engineering going on around each of the environmental concerns that you, that you are highlighting. And I'm wondering, sort of philosophically, if you think that there are any, let's say, moral or ethical implications of doing that, and then also the ecological ones. Are we, are we making a worse problem? Cane toads is something that you talk about, you know, to try and solve one problem by introducing another and actually making it much worse. So I'm just wondering what you think about all of this, call it natural engineering. Well, I, I mean, the book was really grew out of, once again, it was very much a reported book and it grew out of what I saw happening. And I think that what a pattern that you see is that people, you know, very, very, well, meaningly, we, we as a species believe in doing things. You know, that's, that's why we're in the Anthropocene. And um, when we're confronted with a problem, we believe in you know, doing something to solve that problem. And that, that doing of something um, can lead us in a variety of you know, sort of interesting Rube Goldberg-esque you know, um, directions. And that was sort of what I, what I was following out. And I would say that you know, some of the projects in the book are, are happening. You know, I mean, the, the first chapter of the book deals with um, putting up electric barriers on the Mississippi River south of Chicago to prevent, it, try to prevent Asian carp from reaching the Great Lakes. Those, those projects are happening. Um, there's, there's already an electric barrier uh, in place, and there's an, a billion dollars is going to be spent over the next few years putting, in, putting another one in place. So. That, that impulse to, to, okay, let's do something. We, we, we created a mess, let's, let's do something to clean it up, I think is very human and I completely you know, understand it. But um, I think that one of the sort of issues that we're faced with in the Anthropocene is you know, whether we really need to be actually you know, doing less. Um, and that's a critical, a critical question as we go forward. So I just want to kind of bounce off a little bit about that. You, of course, the Anthropocene is above our heads, and <laughs> you, you mentioned that. And something that I've been grappling with a little bit is, and, and I think you, you do talk about it briefly, is you know the, the, the scientific drive of the Anthropocene. But then, since m much more recently, there's been this whole artistic output around the Anthropocene. And I'm I'm wondering, you know, so purist geologists would say, oh, look, this is so off topic. There's no reason to be doing this. We just want to be looking at chemicals in the, in the ground. But then is there a place, you know, you, you just mentioned people want to feel like they're doing something. Is that a, is that a useful outlet or are we just having fun? <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah. Well, I think that, um, once again, that's a pretty, pretty profound question. Ultimately, you know, what what are we what are we doing? And that includes, you know, my own work. Like, what what are you what do you you know? Are we, even if it's a work of journalism, I mean, that's it's an artistic creation. But you know, what what is it? What kind of contribution is it to this you know sort of grand mess? Um, you know, I guess I believe that. I still cling to the idea that you know awareness matters, mm. and I think however people are um, trying to bring awareness to what's going on, I you know I applaud. Now mm. that doesn't mean that every piece of art you know that I um, see or every you know exhibit or or performance that you know, sort of wraps itself in these ideas that I think is good. It doesn't have to be good art, you know, we're not saying necessarily it's good art, but I still applaud the basic idea. And I once spoke, so the, the word Anthropocene was sort of coined by um, this Dutch chemist, Paul Crutzen, who was uh, one, co-won a Nobel Prize for um, discovering um, ozone depleting chemicals that was that was huge i mean we almost really really messed things up with ozone depleting chemicals but managed to sort of get a control of that before the ozone hole you know grew too big 
and I once called, called him up. I never met him, but I called him up, and he said to me that he wanted the term, this term, the Anthropocene, which, which he coined, and he said, I want it to be a warning to the world. And I think that that sort of you know, sums it up. People are trying to sort of you know, bring attention to, the, to this warning. And I, um, mm. you know, whether or not all the efforts, you know, as I say, you know, rise to the level of good art or not, I, I, I still applaud the basic impulse. Oh, I like that. Um, so speaking of people doing something, I'm just going to give a plug. You may have seen a, a slide as we were going through. In, in about a month's time, we have Beth Shapiro coming to talk to us. And she's um, uh, the champion for de-extinction. So she's working, one of her major things is she's working on uh, <coughs> bringing, bless you, bringing the mammoth back, um, the woolly mammoth, and so using DNA to do that. And so, I mean, that's just one of many, many <laughs> different um, techniques that people are, as you say, trying to do something. And I was, I'm just wondering, do you have some, some favorites in your pocket that you'd like, <laughs> yes, this, you know, I've looked at all these, I've talked to these people, and these are the few that really seem like they're going to work. Well, I, I think that is a really interesting question. I'd be, you know, I'd, I'm sorry that I'm not going to be here and Beth is going to be here. Um, I do think one of the questions, and I honestly don't know how I feel about it, but one of the really powerful tools that has been developed in recent years is, is CRISPR, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, which is um, just a very powerful tool for gene editing. Makes it really pretty easy and pretty cheap. And so, you know, de you know, I don't want to steal Beth's thunder or whatever, but, <laughs> you know, de-extinction, de to the extent that it would work, um, would involve taking a near relative of an extinct species, the nearest relative, and sort of back engineering it, so re-engineering its genome using these gene editing techniques, um, and then getting some other creature to, to actually, you know, um, gestate Right. So who's going to gestate that mammal? It's that mammoth. It's going to be an elephant, um, and that's you know sort of the theory behind it. It's a lot harder. You know, <laughs> it's very hard. I'm sure Beth will tell you that. Um, but there are also other things that you could do with CRISPR besides actually bring bringing back an extinct species. For example, you could identify genes that are useful for. Um, you know, heat if living in very hot climate, right? So right. as you change the climate, you could identify genes that are useful to organisms for surviving under under hot. And you know, we're definitely going to do this with our crops. We already are doing it with our crops. Useful for surviving drought. Useful for surviving heat waves. And you could try to insert those genes, you know, into s species. And then you could also use another technique, which is also uses CRISPR, which is called gene drive, which you could then try to um, get that, push that trait out into a wild population. And you may have read about uh, this idea that we could get rid of mosquitoes, malaria, wow. malaria bearing mosquitoes using gene drive. And that, that's what we're talking about. And that's a very, very powerful tool. And people who, the, the very people who developed it are ambivalent. I mean, it's sort of like AI. They're ambivalent about whether we should actually use it or not because mm -hmm. it's so powerful. Wow, thank you. That's, yeah, this, it's just amazing the, the, all of this deep technology that we only have, you know, us mere mortals only have a, a very um, scant idea, but it is, it is so powerful. Now, you, you talked briefly in Under a White Sky about the last three pages, which is a, a wonderful, I, wonderful way of talking about how many authors try to inspire hope into their readers with what they're trying to do. Now, I know a lot of people, myself included, are inspired after reading your books to go and do something. And I'm wondering what you feel about that and whether you think that an individual can make a difference, and who, an individual who isn't David Attenborough or Jane Goodall, what, what can we do 
how do you feel about that? Well, I, I think that it's really important. Um, you know, people talk about, um, you know, social contagion, and mm -hmm. it's, I think, very important. You know, it's very easy to say, well, I, you know, my doing this isn't going to, to change the world, and, you know, it's absolutely true. So my, you know, buying an electric car, my, you know, biking to work or whatever it is, my giving up beef, whatever it is, is not going to change the world, and that's absolutely true. But I think that um, you know all the social science research suggests that people you know follow people whom they trust and 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 look up to, and so you know sort of modeling certain certain behaviors, I guess, um, I do think is really important. And you know there's all these studies. You know if your neighbor has solar panels, you're more likely had to have solar panels. So it's I think it's important not to look at like, well, is this individual action going to change the world? You know, no, we can answer that right away. No, but if 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 I got a thousand, you know, a hundred other people, a thousand other people to do it, would it make a difference? Um, yes, and that I think is true of everything we do. You know, sort of all ethical action, right? We don't really believe that you know our contribution to X or Y uh, is going to save the world, but we believe, well, if everyone did this, it would be a better world. And I think we have to. Um, you know, feel the same way about you know environmental action. Mm. So there is action by doing, or there's communication by doing, but there's also communication by messaging, and I and I'm sure that many in our audience are parents and educators and and mentors, and I'm I'm curious as to what kinds of messaging you think around this is would be most effective for instilling well instilling action but hope versus despair I guess <laughs> you know it's well it's a yeah sobering well there was there's was just a big study people testing different messages and the sort of discomforting result was that none of the messages worked. You know, not hopeful messages, not you know, terrifying messages. N none of them really worked. Now that was obviously, you know, in the context of one of these social science experiments, which you know people will say was not a realistic, um, uh, you know, measure. Um, but I, I guess I always. Um, you know, I, I will say I'm not, you know, I'm not a social scientist. I don't know what messages will work. I hope people are working on figuring that out because, you know, God knows we need it. Um, but I do take refuge in, um, in journalism. You know, I do believe in information. I do believe that, I'm, that the truth matters. I still do believe that um, after all these years. Um, and if it's if it's terrifying, you know, terror is a pretty big motivator, you know, we've, <laughs> yes. we've discovered. Um, yeah. So I don't necessarily, you know, there's, there is a lot of debate, you know, sort of in quote unquote climate circles, like are we just depressing people? Um, and I'm sure people are getting awfully depressed. I myself am getting awfully depressed, but I don't, I don't think as a journalist I can say, well, I'm, you know, that's just too depressing. And we don't say that with other issues. We don't say, well, this is, you know, the war in Ukraine is just too depressing. We're not going to cover it anymore. Um, so I think, as I say, as a journalist, I feel my obligation is, is, is to tell the truth. And how people respond to that is, is their, you know, is their call. Right. So more than most of us, you have delved into the intricacies of some of the planet's biggest environmental concerns. And, you know, the, it, it's fair to say, as in fact you just did, that a lot of the conclusions are really sobering. And so I'm, I'm curious, from a personal level, can you share with us what keeps you going? What, what sustains you through all this thinking? Well, I mean, part of it is, um, you know, part of it is kind of a, you know, on some level I feel, I feel fortunate, like, you know, this is a huge issue. This will, we, you know, pe people, you know, whoever they are will look back at this moment 
um, you know, many hundreds of years from now, and they will say, "What what were they thinking?" You know, and I so I feel mm -hmm. like, um, you know, it's it sort of has a, a mission quality to it, like to try to, you know, bear witness, I suppose, and and, and record, you know, sort of what what was going on. Um, but you know, what keeps me going on another level is. Um, you know, we live on a great planet. You know, we're very, uh, we're, we're awfully fortunate. It's a great planet we have here. And I've been very fortunate. One of the sort of ironies in reporting the sixth extinction was I went to some of the most fantastic places on mm. Earth, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, the Amazon rainforest. And I guess what keeps me going is, you know, we got to, we got to rise to the occasion. We don't, we don't really have a choice, you know, and I, I guess, um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the best I can do. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> really, Great Barrier Reef in Amazon is pretty good. Yeah. Um, so just to, to wrap things up, um, I, you know, I, I know you have a lot of fans in the audience and a lot of fans worldwide. And I know that lots of people might be wondering if there was anything you could share about any new projects or new directions, things you're interested in. Well, I, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm thinking about thinking about writing a book, <laughs> but it's a little bit, um, you know, writing a book is a little bit like, like, like childbirth, you know, you, you go through it and you think, I never, never want to do that again, and then you kind of, um, enough time goes by and you, you think, oh, that wasn't so bad, you know, so. Um, <laughs> So I'm 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 thinking about about a book, and I guess the only thing I will say is it has a big um, a big history of science component. Oh great! Well, <laughs> I hope you'll come back when you're doing the research. So um, we we now have time for some audience questions, but before we do that, I just wanted to thank our very esteemed guest Elizabeth Colbert uh, to talk to us tonight. All right, we have a, a large live stream audience viewing from around the world, so we want to get the audio of your questions on the uh, live stream feed. So I'll come by with a microphone, just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll get to as many as we can before we start the book signing. Wow. <laughs> That's bright. All right, wake up, everybody. Hi, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, you spoke a little bit about trying to present the truth and that the facts matter. And I think we have this idea that like, well, the, the truth will win out. It's clear now, I think maybe it's always been this way, but th there's a, a strong component where people are actively trying to, to dissuade that and act against that for what, whatever reasons. How do you combat that? Well, that, that's such a good question. I mean, you know, I, I, I wish, <laughs> I, I so, so wish I had the answer to that. And I think that, you know, we are being forced, certainly we in the news business has that, and the journalism are, are really, you know, being rocked back on our heels and being really forced to um, ask that question every single day. Um, I don't think anyone has come up with a good answer for it and so it remain you know it's become almost you know honestly it's it's at this point sort of an article of faith right i mean just to, to sort of say well i i still believe you know that the truth matters and it's like well the evidence suggests you're wrong you know <laughs> so um so there's a kind of a hitting your head against the wall quality here but i still think you know it's i mean i um you, the uh, do you have any Copernicus here? Do you have any? We do have Copernicus here. Okay, well, here. you know, yes, absolutely. you know, and still it moves. You know, it's it's not going to. You know, the the resistance to um, the facts aren't going to change the facts. And um, you know, I think that that um, you know those of us who have spent our whole lives, you know, in, and it's certainly true for for the scientists that I speak to, you know, who are in really desperate you know, feel really desperate about it, um, that, you know, you just keep trying, but, um, 
you know, there are a lot, a lot of people trying to think about how to bridge what seems to be an unbridgeable divide at this point. And I don't have, a, I, I don't have the answer. Well, we have a question about Midway back in the room. I'm wondering, uh, subject climate change, and uh, I'm tracking things going on, and I'm actually quite impressed with progress over the last couple of years. And actually this week, two things happened that I thought would never happen in my lifetime. Yesterday, the Saudi energy uh, envoy minister explained why he was pausing research for new oil, and the answer was too much renewable energy today. Wow. And I was wondering if you were aware of that, and as well as the International Energy Agency fighting in the news with the OPEC people about whether or not their estimate of peak oil by before 2030 is actually accurate. So there are some positive things going on, I guess, and I don't know if everybody's aware, aware of those. No, absolutely. There's, I mean, I think that, you know, you know, there's that um, saying, you know, may you live in interesting times. You know, we, we certainly live in interesting times. And one of the, you know, one of the big, huge questions of our time, you know, there, there is a lot going on. There's a tremendous amount of progress that's been made in terms of driving down the cost of solar and wind and, you know, renewable. And, and there's, you know, just so much work going on in battery technology. And, you know, it is going to be, our, our energy infrastructure is going to look very different. I, I think that's absolutely true. You know, the, the problem is, is, is the speed and the problem is also, you know, we in the U.S. who are, you know, we're the world's biggest emitters uh, on a historical uh, basis. Um, but there's also a lot of the world that wants to develop, you know, their own oil. You know, the Nigerians want to develop the oil. The Guyanese want to develop their own oil. So, and it's very hard for us to say, well, you can't do that, you know, because we, we did it. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so we're at this sort of hinge moment. I do think we are at this, this critical moment. And which way we go, I guess, you know, that's another thing that keeps me going. You know, which way we go is, is a really open question. Um, there are a lot of forces that you could, you could look at the data and you could say, great. You could draw a trend line and say, great. And you could look at the data and draw a trend line and say, terrible. And both would be true right now. All right, Elizabeth, we have a question way back, back here in the back of the room on your left. Frequency um, environmentalism has had to tackle with misanthropy in its ranks, especially the kind that ha usually has some white supremacist underpinnings and like, especially with like Malthusian rhetoric, how's a good way to like push it back against that? Well, that's a good yeah, question. Yeah, that, that, uh, as Eric's <laughs> saying, that's, that's a heavy question. You know, I think that, um, you know, without going, you know, very deeply into the whole history of sort of the environmental movement, you know, I think one important thing and that has really come to the fore in like climate negotiations right is the most the people who are most vulnerable to climate change are the people who are already living you know at the edge so the question of equity and the question of environmental you know justice is is a huge is a huge one um, and so i think that it's hard to really level against you know if we're just talking about climate change there's a lot of other issues we could talk about, but we're going to put those aside for a minute. We're just talking about climate change. It's it's kind of hard to say that dealing with climate change um, isn't a crucial, absolutely critical issue for the most vulnerable people on Earth. I don't think there's any way to say to argue that that's not true. Now, how we're going to do that in an equitable way, and that gets back to the question of, well, you guys, you know, cause the problem. Um, and now you expect you know, us not to sell our oil. I mean, these are huge questions. I don't have an answer for that. But I don't think you can really raise the charge of you know, misanthropy in those, um, in those conversations. Elizabeth, we have a question uh, midway back in the room on your left. So as a journalist, I have a question about language. Have you noticed a language change in over the last 20 years? Because we don't say global warming anymore. We say climate change. And now there's like trigger words especially 
over the previous administration. Um, have you noticed the language change and to try to be less triggering to sort of help out with those people who automatically say no? Well, that, that's a really interesting question. And, you know, someone should really do a very, you know, deep dive into, into the language question. And, you know, there was a time back in sort of when I started out in this beat, like 20 years ago, when, when people were sort of substituting climate change because it was less, you know, supposedly less um, uh, politically fraught. How's that? We'll use that term. And, um, but then a lot of scientists, you know, sci scientists have completely adopted the term climate change because you, you, can, you could get some parts of the world getting colder, you know, as a result of climate change. And so, you know, and also people also felt like global warming, which, you know, which, which you, we, you might feel, well, that was a more direct way of saying things and that was more, you know, scary or whatever. But some people were like, well, people love to go to Florida. You know, global warming sounds pretty good. You know, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so I, I, I feel as a journalist, you know, to be honest, that both terms are terrible. They're like, they're not, you know, elegant. They're not, um, they're clunky. They don't do much for a sentence, you know. I, I, so I, I wish that someone would come up with a better, you know, just a better term. Um, but, but I don't know what it would be exactly. So I, I don't, you know, some people have talked about what well, we should be talking about, the, you know, just the climate crisis, the climate emergency. Um, but once again, I'm not sure that sort of, sort of would work in a sentence. <laughs> All right, we're going to stay here on your left towards the middle of the room for our next question. Uh, in uh, your presentation uh, this evening, uh, most recently you said very important to uh, have a consensus of the public and awareness of the public that something is going on. There are many, many people who will say, oh yeah, there's something going on. It still hasn't uh, reach the level of how you would say uh, s synapse, okay, across the board. But I'm very, I'm very hopeful because Mother Nature is, uh, she's a great teacher, <laughs> and um, and we're learning every day that uh, it can snow in <laughs> Florida, and you can freeze your butt off in uh, Cuba. So I think we're on the right track. Uh, Mother Nature will um, yeah. uh, educate us. Yes, she will. I completely agree with that. Um, she, 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 she always, as they say, she always bats last, yeah. <laughs> All right, we got a question on the uh, east side of the room now. Back here about midway through the room. Uh, this one's a little complicated. Um, you work in the print media, and um, I have a concern. This is the first extinction, I believe, that we can actually record in primary terms as it's happening. And I, I look around, and I, what I see here in this library in print media is the fossil of our intellect. Are you concerned about the extinction of the fossil of our intellect. You mean you mean to say that 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 print that like media. print media as reading, a, reading is reading is dying or print media? I print mean, media is dying. Print, yeah, a, oh. a, a long-term fossil of our yeah. intellect, not digital media, which can be changed at the snap of a finger. Yeah. Well, I I am concerned. I'm you know uh, it's it, you if you work in print journalism or really honestly any kind of journalism right now. Um, you are profoundly concerned that journalism as a whole is a threatened enterprise. I mean, the web has just come through and completely destroyed the business model, not just, not just for print, for broadcast, for everything. You know, it's just um, a, a, you know, the carnage. Um, so I, I used to joke with the, with the sixth extinction, it was unclear which was going to go extinct first, you know, the sixth extinction, <laughs> journalism, you know. Um, so I think there's no journalist who doesn't feel profoundly uh, disturbed by that. And you know, that gets back to the question of do we value information? And you know, it goes way beyond you know, environmental 
um, uh, you know, in, in information on these, you know, really profound, you know, global world historical problems. It goes down to, you know, what what happened at the city council meeting last night. You know, how how are people getting that information these days? And so I think it's, you know, a real threat. You know, I would argue a real threat to our democratic institutions. We just have no uh, way of knowing even anymore what they're doing. So it's, it, I think it's a serious problem. Right, we have a question up front here on your left. And uh, let me also say that for our live stream viewers, type in your questions on Zoom and I'm monitoring those. So we'll get to those questions as well. Thank you, I've enjoyed your comments very much. I'm uh, with an organization locally called Bridging the Gap. We're an environmental group. And I just wanna put a plug in for working locally on our own ecosystems and helping restore them. We have had a lot of success with remnant lands here in the urban footprint of Kansas City, Missouri. We have about 450 acres of, of lands that have never been uh, grazed or plowed and underneath their layer of invasive species are the original seed bank, the original soil microbes to, that can be restored and brought back to life. And this kind of work is actually a great panacea to the kind of despair that I know everyone is feeling. Um, we also work on many other things, including Kansas City's declining and aging urban tree canopy, which is a problem across the United States. We're working on equitable housing. And so um, my point is stay busy and do do things. Hopefully they're, they're the right things. Thank you for well, letting I, me I, say that. I applaud that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Any additional questions? Anybody? All right, back here on your left. Um, I really enjoy your writing in the New Yorker. It's, I'm not a science major, but I understand when I read your articles. Thank you. And you talked about with all these new technologies and they're going, they're happening. And I go back to a question that I came up with for my kids earlier, which was, can we, should we? Well, can we? Of course we can. Do we ever ask the question, should we? So that's what I kind of leave with your idea. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, an absolutely critical, you know, it's like the, the Chekhov line, you know, if there's, a, if there's a gun on the wall in the first act, it's gonna be you know, used in the third act. I mean, you know, we're, we're watching this in absolute real time with AI, right? I mean, you know, so many people saying, is this really what we want to be doing? But there it is. You know, we just have no, uh, we live in this world where for whatever reason, and I, you know, that could be your next speaker series where, you know, technologies come into being and we don't really have, if they have a lot of, you know, force behind them um, and a lot of, you know, often a lot of money behind them, um, there's no uh, mechanism to to there's there's nothing no no body that can say well let's let's just let's just you know put the brakes on this for a bit and let's think about it um, so we're always playing catch up um, legislatively you know policy wise and that's completely what's going to happen to AI and it brings me back to the point about journalism because it's going to destroy what's left of journalism <laughs> and you know that's what's just going to happen and then we're going to have the pieces and maybe something, someone will say in retrospect, we really ought to have done something about that, you know, but it'll be too late. So I think we see that over and over again. And, you know, um, Ed Wilson had this line that I always like to quote. He said, we have, you know, um, Paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, and space age technologies, you know. <laughs> What, what could go wrong, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and we see that over and over again. Yeah. And, and we're just gonna keep seeing it because our technologies get better and better, but our brains do not really get better and better. All right, Elizabeth, back here on your left towards the back of the room. Thank you very much, enjoyed it. Uh, I'm not a big reader and I haven't 
done enough research to really ask this question, but the question is, it just seems to me personally that you mentioned we could draw a line and say, this is going to be the future and this is going to be the future and one's very good and one's very bad. I just think that we're, if, if the temperature was so critical, I think we've hit a tipping point and things that I read about what goes on in the United States are so unrepresentative of what goes on in the world in the total ecological situation that is there anything out there that points more directly to this is what we're going to end up with in 10 or 20 years uh, to make people more realizing. Uh, ultimately, I agree with the mother nature theory that if homo sapiens don't survive or if they do survive in a far less, the world's not going any place. But I hate to think of my grandkids and their children. Uh, any thoughts on those things as to how to make this more realistic? Terror is an effective thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, you know, one thing that we're um, seeing and maybe, you know, maybe Kansas will become the new, um, new hotspot uh, as a result, you know, um, coastal, you know, a lot, of, a lot of places on the coast, the East Coast, that where you're seeing the effects of sea level rise already and um, people, you know, people's houses, you know, fall, not necessarily exactly falling into the water, but getting very hard to insure. And um, so, you know, in terms of a future, like, you know, is there a place where you can, you know, quote unquote, see the future? I don't, I, that would be a wonderful thing to have if we had like that, where you could put on your VR goggles, you know, and just see the future, that would be, that's a great idea, actually. <laughs> um, I don't think, there's no place I can point to, um, but definitely a lot of places in the world are, are, are feeling the future. And, you know, you're, you know, 65 degrees out there, you know, we're feeling the future right here. Um, so, but um, I don't have exactly like, you know, where, where we could go to, to sort of vividly see the future. All right, let's end, we're, we're at the top of the hour. Let's end with an online question from Carrie, who asked, you mentioned the concept of doing less. Can you expand on that or give an example? Well, I, I, I do. I mean, I think that, you know, we, 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 especially in the U.S., you know, we have very, very high consumption. You look at our, you know, consumption patterns versus the rest of the globe, and that those are, you know, why we have such high sort of average uh, emissions. And I think, you know, a lot of people look at uh, that and say, well, you know, what we, what we need to do is, is, is do less. We need to live um, s smaller, how about that? Not living larger, live smaller. And I do think that even despite a lot of great technological breakthroughs, ultimately that, that's probably true. We are probably living at a, at a moment of maximum consumption and, and we need to bring that down. And so um, that's, what, that's what I mean by doing less. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. Dorfman. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you for tonight's program. We're going to start the book signing very soon. Get your copy, your signed copy of The Sixth Extinction and Under a White Sky with Rainy Day Books in the East Alcove of the Main Reading Room. Visit lindahall.org for information on all of our upcoming programs. Beth Shapiro's talk on the science of the extinction uh, was mentioned earlier. That'll be March 7th, 7 p.m., right here in the Main Reading Room. We also have David Allen Sibley author of the Sibley Bird Guides here March 28th. lindahaw.org, uh, get, uh, get signed up tonight. Thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>